I want to start things off this morning by sharing with you a passage of Scripture that uh, has meant a lot to me for over 35 years. And this is a passage I got to thinking about this past week in view of what we're talking about today. I got to thinking about this passage and, and uh, I couldn't really recall the last time we've talked about it in here. I think it's been a number uh, of years ago. And, uh, and it's such a rich passage of Scripture that uh, let's consider it as our warm-up passage to our message, okay? It's not the primary, the key passage that we're going to be focusing our attention on, but, uh, but this passage uh, is really rich, okay? Here it is. It's 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, and it reads like this. But you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. One of the cool things about this passage is that it, it, it uh, just, you know, kind of capsule summarize, uh, summarizes in, in two verses, a before and after. You know, in, and we see that all the time in advertising. We see that in commercials, you know, when they're, they're talking about weight loss products. You know, they do the before and then they do the after. Or if you're talking about a house renovation, the before and then the after. Just to show the contrast, you know, the, the amount of change. That had taken place. Well, there are several places in the Bible that uh, various writers that God had used to pen the words of Scripture, they, they used that same before after contrast thing in order to really drive home an important point. And Peter is doing that right here in this passage. And what adds to the significance here is when you understand the context of who it is that he's writing to. Unlike a lot of the letters in the New Testament, this was not written to a specific church, like the church in Colossa, thus the name Colossians, or the church in Ephesus, thus the name Ephesians. Now, this, this just bears um, the human writer's name, Peter. It's his first letter. That's why it's called First. Peter. But if you look in the early verses of chapter 1, you see that this was written to Christians who were scattered because of persecution. These are people, now try to, try to mentally put yourself in, in their skin. These were people who not only have lost their businesses, for those that were business owners, but they've lost their homes. They've lost their land. It's not like they had an auction and sold their house. No, they lost it. They were run out because they were Christians on that basis. Persecution. Okay? And, and for many of them, too, they, the, the, the close friends that they had that perhaps they had lived close to for years, now they have no clue where they are. Maybe even some of their relatives. They've lost track of some of their relatives. Because, see, this is the dispersion, and that's actually one of the words used in the early part of this letter, because of persecution. So, so in a very real sense, the people that Peter is writing to, these are people that uh, um, perhaps were down, their heads were hanging a bit, because some really rough things had just happened to them, all because of their faith. All right. So when you understand it from that perspective, all of a sudden when you're reading what it is that Peter is writing to them, it takes on special meaning because now you're appreciating better what Peter is aware of that maybe you weren't aware of previously. So let's reread it from this perspective and understanding. Peter says, but you are a chosen people. See, it, this whole thing of faith and everything, it didn't start with you choosing God. God chose you. Right? You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. The word holy literally means set apart. You're a set apart nation, God's special possession. 
that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people. That was then. But this is now. Now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy. But that was then. Now you have received mercy. You see, you see how richer the passage is? Just with a little additional insight, you know, of, of the context and, and, and who in particular it is that Peter is writing to. Well, this passage, these two verses, the part of it that probably gets the least amount of attention is found up in that top line. I mean, we talk about chosen people, God's special possession, being called out of darkness. I mean, those are things we, we talk about. But how often do we talk about being a royal priesthood? Not very often. Out of everything in the passage, that's probably the thing that we kind of skip over the quickest. A big reason why is because we have the least amount of experience of what being a priesthood, let alone a royal one, has to do with anything. I mean, what, what exactly is that? We, we don't really know because we don't really live in, in a setting where we see that or or, or were taught that. But that's what I want to draw your attention to today because I think it serves as an excellent springboard to what we're talking about. He says, and remember, it's not just because they were scattered Christians. They were Christians. And he refers to them as being a royal priesthood. Now that ties in, you see at the bottom of the slide, verse 5, something he had already said in the context. He had referred to the Christians as offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. And we all know that's what priests do, right? I mean, if you have the backdrop, the understanding of what was here, what we call the Old Testament, then you know that's what a priest does. But in this context, he specifically is referring to them as offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. And then just a handful of verses later, he refers to them as being a royal priesthood. Now, if you know anything at all about the Old Testament, you know that sacrifices were central to the religious life of the people of Israel. They were offering animal sacrifices all the time. Whether it was way back in the early days in the, the portable temple, which was called a tabernacle, or the permanent temple, which was called the temple. In Jerusalem, there was animal sacrifices being offered all the time, whether it was sheep or goats or bulls or doves. I mean, there were certain unclean animals that would have never been offered as sacrifices, but, but there were a number of different animals. But it was always the priest that offered the sacrifice. Even if, let's say, you and your family, let's say you just lived a day's journey away from Jerusalem, and so, uh, you know, the, the, an annual occasion arose that you planned to go to Jerusalem to bring a sheep with you and to offer it as a sacrifice there. The way that that worked is that you and your family did not go to Jerusalem and go right into the temple, right up to the altar, the burnt offering altar, and you sacrificed. That was not the way it worked because you couldn't do that. You had to pass off that little sheep. You had to pass that off to a priest. That was the priest's job. You handed it off to the priest. The priest then went and on your behalf offered that sheep as a sacrifice. A priest was a go-between, was a go-between between you and God. That's what priests were. So that was their responsibility is to offer the sacrifices. Well, according to this passage of Scripture, it's saying that that's what now we are all about. We are a royal priesthood. Have you ever heard anyone use the phrase, um, the priesthood of all believers? Yeah, this is one of the passages that that comes from. The Bible teaches. We don't live in the old covenant anymore. We're in the new covenant. It's the priesthood of all believers. Now, for clarification, just so that I'm not assuming anything here that you understand, um, I want to make a, a point crystal clear. I am not your priest. Okay? Sorry if that burst some bubble that maybe you had that you thought that I was your priest. I am not your priest. Brad Fogo, who is on vacation in Colorado this week, he is not your priest. 
Tracy really wants to be your priest, but, but he is not your priest either, okay? All right, we, we are not your priests. We're pastors, but that's something totally different than a priest, than what the role and responsibility of a priest was. Like I said, a priest served as the go-between between between God and man, but you know, that's no longer needed because of what Jesus did. Jesus offered that ultimate sacrifice. And you have passages like Hebrews 10, verses 12 through through 14, it says, after Christ offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God with one sacrifice he made perfect forever, those who are being made holy. There is no longer any need for any blood sacrifices to be made. That altar in Jerusalem is obsolete now in regards to offering animal sacrifices, no longer needed. Jesus offered the ultimate atoning sacrifice when he voluntarily went to the cross and died on our behalf. But we still got this business of us being a royal priesthood. Just so you know, we don't offer animal sacrifices, okay? We don't do that. I know you've been looking for a purpose for cats being in existence, but we don't (laughs) offer, we don't offer... Let me go ahead and apologize now because I, I bothered somebody in the first service by that statement. So if what I said, let's see, how do the politicians say it? If what I said offended anybody, then I'm sorry. In other words, if you're not offended, I'm not sorry for anything I just said. You know, I guess that's what that means. We don't offer, we don't offer animal sacrifices, but, but still... You've got to ask the question, though, because in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, which I showed down at the bottom of the screen, it talked about spiritual sacrifices. So we've got to ask this question, what are these spiritual sacrifices? They're not animals, okay? They're not blood sacrifices. That we're certain of. But what are these spiritual sacrifices, Due to time limitations, I want to show you one primary passage before we get into our main passage, okay? But this one here is a great one. Hebrews chapter 13, and appropriately it's in the book of Hebrews because the whole purpose of the book of Hebrews is to show how Jesus, you know, has fulfilled all of that and we don't have to continue to offer animal sacrifices anymore. That's what Hebrews is all about. But yet, in the final chapter of Hebrews, we read this. Hebrews 13, verses 15 and 16. It says, Therefore, through him, and that's a reference to the Lord Jesus, through him, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of our lips that confess his name. Don't neglect to do what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. There we go. All right, it's talking about sacrifices here. And in these two verses, it actually references three sacrifices. And I'm not going to elaborate, you know, long and hard on this, but I do want you to see what is being taught here so you have some kind of an appreciation for what these spiritual sacrifices look like The first one is mentioned in the first half of this, verse 15, where it refers to a sacrifice of praise, all right? There's one, spiritual sacrifice, a sacrifice of praise. And in case that's not clear enough, um, he, he breaks that down even more by saying that is the fruit of our lips that confess his name. So here just a moment ago, we were singing. We had, we had the lyrics up on the screen, and we were singing these different praise songs. And in a very real sense, there was spiritual sacrifice being given to the Lord. The fruit of lips that are confessing his name. That's what was happening here this morning. However, I don't want you to have too narrow of an understanding on this, because it's not limited to that. Say, for example, on Friday, you had a meeting with an acquaintance of yours for lunch. And you sat across the table at uh, some restaurant, um, and, and 
big part of the reason you wanted to meet with them is you're really concerned about where they're at spiritually, where they're at with the Lord. And you use that opportunity to, to share your testimony, to share about your faith and how much the Lord means to you in hopes that they would be responsive to that that they would have a soft heart and they would hear and the seeds would be planted in their life. Well, you see, in a very real sense, what you did is you showed a demonstration of the fruit of your lips confessing his name. And there was not a drummer. There was not someone playing bass guitar. There was not someone playing a keyboard in the background. Well, I guess that depends on what restaurant you're at, but there probably wasn't, you know, that kind of thing going on. But yet you offered a spiritual sacrifice just by professing your faith in Christ, confessing your faith to another person. So it's not just something that happens in a Sunday morning context, okay? So that's one spiritual sacrifice, the sacrifice of praise. Two, what you see in the second part of this, verse 16, it says, don't neglect to do good, you know, and then it says, and to share... For God is pleased with such sacrifices. So it's talking about sacrifices. It says, don't neglect to do what is good. So we're talking good deeds here or good works. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that we're talking here about salvation and you need to do good works in order to get saved and all. That's not even, that's not even the topic we're dealing with here because the only way you can be saved is through what Jesus did when he died on the cross on your behalf. And what we're talking about is now that you are a Christian, you are part of the royal priesthood, and you need to be offering spiritual sacrifices. That's what we're talking about. And so the second sacrifice that's referenced in this passage is good deeds. And you know the cool thing about that? Man, that can happen anytime, any place. That could happen outside of the grocery store in the parking lot when you go out and put all your bags and groceries away and everything and you see someone that you, their car won't start, they got a dead battery, and you know you got jumper cables in the trunk. And you're saying, hey, you want me to, want me to give your car a jump? Sure. Right then and there, a spiritual sacrifice was offered because you're doing that because of your faith. You're doing that because the Lord has been so good to you that you want to be good to others. See, that's a sacrifice you just made. And those come in all shapes and sizes. The third one here, it goes on and says, don't neglect to do what is good. It says, and to share. Now we're talking generosity, number three. Spiritual sacrifice, number three, generosity. Generosity. This, this, is where, this is where you take some of your hard-earned money and you are actually blessing someone else maybe who's, who's hard up or has fallen on hard times or they've had some difficulties happening and medical stuff going on in their family and so you're reaching out and helping them. Or maybe this involves sharing in regards to making a missions possible by supporting you know, a missionary and so the promotion of the gospel can happen in other areas outside of even our area right here. And, and that is a way of sharing. You're offering a spiritual sacrifice by doing that. But the bottom line, it's basically taking what a lot of people would look at as being yours and you have every right to keep it, but yet you're sharing it. You're giving it to others. That's a spiritual sacrifice. So you look at this passage, and only in two verses' time, we already see and gain some insight into three different spiritual sacrifices. And part of the reason I wanted to take the time to touch on this as we start this short two-part message series is because we are so accustomed to equating worship to what happens in this room that sometimes this is all we think in, is worship, is what happens when we get here. If 915 is your service of preference, your worship service, then what happens here at 915, this is when worship happens in your life. And what I'm wanting to do this morning is I'm wanting to challenge that because I think you got too narrow of a perspective with that. The reality of the matter is that little phrase, worship service, that's not even found in the Bible. 
that phrase. In fact, nowhere in the New Testament are we commanded to go to worship. Now understand, I'm not trying to take anything away from what happens here on a Sunday morning because I think there is something of great value that does happen here on Sunday morning and I do believe that it falls within the will of God that each and every of of his people gather together with fellow believers in settings like this. I, I do think that that concept is biblical. I mean, I see passages in the Bible like Hebrews 10, 25. It says we should not stop gathering together with other believers as some of you are doing. Instead, we must continue to encourage each other even more as we see the day coming, the day approaching. You see, back in the first century, there was kind of a dynamic that was happening that, that isn't so unlike what happens in the 21st century. And that is some Christians, for whatever reason, decide, ah, you know what, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to meet together with God's people. I'm not going to go and, and be with the church. You know, remember, the church isn't the building. The church is God's people. I'm not going to go and meet with God's people. Um, this is my only day to sleep in. Maybe that's part of the, the reasoning behind all that. Or maybe this is the only day that I can really pursue my favorite hobby. And so that's what Sundays are going to be about. So, yeah, I'm not going to be able to do that. You know, or maybe the weather is so great. You know, I mean, this is my day for camping. And so I'm focused on that. And so that takes preference. I mean, there could be any, any of multiple dozens of reasons that go through a person's mind as to why they would just kind of dismiss and say, nah, I think I'll just skip that. But the scripture directly refers to that kind of thinking and saying, don't let that kind of thinking creep into your mind as it does some people. For some people, that's the way they approach it in their Christian life. Don't let you become one of those people. You know, that's what that verse is saying. In addition to that, I know there are passages like Psalm 100, verse 4. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. You know, so I know the idea of when we get together and we're with God's people and that praise is on our lips, I know that there's biblical concept and precedence that is found regarding all that. But the point that I'm trying to make is that worship should not be limited in our thinking to what we do in this room, period. Don't make that mistake. Because that is way too narrow of an understanding. The sacrifice of praise, that can happen over a lunch table, like I said. It can happen over the backyard fence. Good deeds, that can happen in a parking lot. Generosity, that can happen anywhere. That can happen on online on your computer yeah worship it goes beyond just what happens in this room all right now having said all that i think we're ready i think we're ready for our main verse today um this verse, I think, just hits the nail right on the head when you're talking about the kind of sacrifices as royal priests that the priesthood of all believers that we are to be offering, I, th- I think this passage just hits it out of the park. Okay, you ready for it? It's Romans 12, verse 1. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. I want, let me talk to you just a second about the word spiritual. A lot of translations use the word spiritual there at the tail end of that verse. So it's not just the, the translation that's on the screen. Several translations do this. However, um, I want you to know that, that the actual word that's used there goes beyond what we typically think of as spiritual. The Greek word is logikos. I'm sure I butchered it, but that's, that's uh, the phonetic way of saying it anyway, the Greek word, logikos. It's where we get the English word logical. Check your footnote. If you've got your Bible open, I would venture to guess most of the Bibles have a footnote at this point, 
and it will either be under the word spiritual or it might be under the, the word worship. But if you look down, you'll see the footnote. It says reasonable. Yeah. That's what it's talking about. After saying what it says earlier in that verse, it says, this is your reasonable worship. Now, as we're going to see in a moment, as we break all that down, there are a few of us that would uh, have the inclination of saying, well, that sounds reasonable. <laughs> Instead, we'd say, man, that sounds extreme to me. Yeah, but you got to understand the whole verse. And once you really wrap your mind around what the whole verse is talking about, you should come around to understand it is reasonable. What this verse is saying, it is reasonable. So that's what we're talking about is reasonable worship. Today we're going to look at what is found in verse 1. Next week we'll look at what is found in verse 2. So what did he just say right before he said, this is your reasonable act of worship? He just got done saying we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Living sacrifices. I don't know about you, but that kind of sounds to me like an like a oxymoron. Living sacrifices. I mean, that's kind of like when someone says jumbo shrimp. It's like jumbo shrimp, you know. It's like how do those words go together? Or deafening silence. Or, or here's one that, that you've you not only have heard, you've probably used this. And it, do, it really sounds silly when you just pull these two words out and just say them together without any other words around them. Pretty ugly. <laughs> I mean, think about it. You know, we say that about things. Well, that was pretty ugly. It's like pretty ugly. I mean, those seem to totally contradict one another. That's what an oxy moron is and, and that's that's what this verse is saying living sacrifices well aren't sacrifices dead i mean yeah if you've got this fallback here you know the old covenant the old testament and all these animal sacrifices and and everything that were offered countless hundreds of thousands of sacrifices that were offered over the centuries they were dead every single one of them Unless one happened to run away during the exchange from the family to the priest, that had been the only way. But then it wasn't a sacrifice because it got away, it got loose. So when you think about sacrifices, you're always thinking of dead. But, but yet this passage is talking about living sacrifices. And so it kind of challenges us a little bit there because we're not used to thinking along those lines. But yet it is consistent with stuff that we see in the New Testament. For example, let me show you another verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. It's talking about the very same thing, but it uses none of the same terminology. Here's the way it reads. He, referring to Jesus, he died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. That basically is saying the same thing as Romans 12.1 in regards to that concept, living sacrifice. It's talking about the same thing. You see, the idea here is that each day anew, we are to live our lives kind of like what Jesus did that day that he was arrested. Remember, he was in the garden, and they came to him. and Well, before they came to him, he was praying, and he was saying, God, if there's any way for this cup of suffering to, to pass. And, but he, what did he say that in his prayer? He said, but yet not my will, but your will be done. And we hear that, and it's just like, wow. Man, how, how great our, our Lord is, that he would have that attitude. Not my will, but your will be done. Whoa, you know, exalt him, you know, and, and, and let's worship him. And look at that attitude that Jesus had on our behalf. But yet what we're seeing as we look in these passages, like the one on the screen or Romans chapter 12, is basically what scripture is saying, okay, now it's your turn to have that attitude. Where your prayer is not my will, but your will be done. I mean, that's kind of what these passages are all about. So figuratively speaking, as Christians, each day we are to crawl on top of the altar and we are to live that day for the Lord. 
I mean, if you want to visualize it, visual it like that. Think of the altar that all these sacrifices were offered on through the centuries. And basically what these scriptures are saying is that you and me as believers, we now should take our turn and each day crawl up on that altar and live that day for the Lord. That's what it's talking about. The heart continues to beat in our chest because we're a living sacrifice, but we're living it for the Lord. So since it's a sacrifice, it's up on the altar. It means we give ourselves totally over to him, not partially, not partially, it's 100%. No one went to the temple in Jerusalem taking uh, their, their little sheep on a leash and going up to the priest and said to the priest, um, okay, I would like today to offer up his right hindquarters. Okay, and when you're done with that, if you could bring him back, uh, I'll take him home. And so then a half hour later, the, the little sheep comes back on a leash with only three legs, you know, and they take the sheep home. There were no sacrifices like that. There were no partial sacrifices. They were 100%. So when you're up on the altar, 100% of you is up on the altar. Not just, not just your arm, not just your leg, all of you. Now, as some people have said or suggested, there's one problem with a living sacrifice. Not that we see this in the Old Testament, because like I said, there weren't living sacrifices. But, but there would be one problem with a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice would probably have the tendency to crawl off the altar and not stay up there. I can see that, and I'm sure you can too. But that's why every day anew we crawl back up on the altar. Every day anew as we live out our life. What's the motivation for this? Glad you asked. Let's go back to the verse. Romans 12, verse 1 gives us that answer. It says, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. There you see the motivation in view of God's mercy. My paraphrase of what I think the verse is saying here in regards to motivation is it is saying, in view of all that God has done for you, this is the reasonable thing for you to do in response. This is reasonable. You consider Jesus left heaven, took on human flesh, came down here on earth, voluntarily allowed himself to be crucified on the cross to make possible for you to escape hell and judgment of your sin. In view of that, it is reasonable that you offer yourself as a living sacrifice, that this is your response. That's the argument. It's all found right here in this verse. I find it interesting that, that Paul is basing this appeal primarily on the mercy of God and not the grace of God. I mean, like our last song that we sang this morning, it had to do with the grace of God. And we like amazing grace and we talk about the grace of God and all this. But, but this verse is specifically appealing to due to the mercy of God. What is the difference between grace and mercy? Well, the way, the way that I help keep that distinction in my mind is grace is God giving you what you don't deserve. That's what grace is. God gives you the gift of his Holy Spirit. God gives you the gift of a home in heaven in eternity. God gives you what you don't deserve. That's God's grace. Mercy is God not giving you what you deserve. It's kind of looking at it from a different perspective. But that's what mercy is. God not giving you what you deserve. And you know, there's a lot of people that uh, over the years I've heard complain uh, that God is not a fair God, you know, because this happened, that happened, this didn't happen, whatever. That God's not a fair God. Uh, you know, and, and that particular complaint that sometimes is thrown out there, I just want you to know, I'm glad God is not a fair God. I am really glad God is not a fair God. Because if God was fair, then that would mean he would give me what I deserve. And I don't like to even think about what I deserve. 
because of sin, because of some of the choices that I've made in my life. I deserve not only to be separated from him in the here and now, but I deserve, due to his holiness, to be separated for all of eternity. So I'm glad that God is not a fair God in giving me what I deserve. Notice the verse. It starts off with the word therefore. Pretty much every translation has the word therefore right at the beginning. If not, it might be the fourth or fifth word, but still, it's, it's at the beginning of the statement. The word therefore, it's, it's a key word, it's a transitionary word, it's a word that basically is saying, based on what has just been stated or said, this now is the conclusion of the matter, okay? And, and, and the, the way Romans is divided up is kind of interesting, because the first 11 chapters of Romans is doctrinal stuff. The last four chapters, chapters 12 through 16, is practical stuff. Or to say it another way, basically what you have in the first 11 chapters is how we came to God. And then in the last four chapters, how you live for God. And so it's, it's a key transitional moment in what Paul is writing. And so he says, therefore. Basically he's saying, therefore. Since he didn't hold your sin against you, because that's what he dealt with in the preceding chapters. Since he didn't hold your sin against you, since he isn't going to throw you into hell, since he's altered your eternal destiny, this is what you should now do in response. Paul's point is really clear. Being a Christian is more than church attendance. And like I said, I don't want to assume anything here. So I I don't know whether you've been a Christian for a lot of years or whether you have only been a believer or follower of Christ for a number of weeks or a few months. Understand, being a Christian is more than church attendance. It ought to include church attendance because we already looked at one of those verses. We We ought to be getting together with brothers and sisters in Christ. The Bible talks about that. But being a Christian is more than just this time period on Sunday morning being given to the Lord. Being a Christian is more than owning a Bible. In today's day and age, with printing presses and all of this kind of stuff, you know, having a copy of Scripture is something that that all of us ought to have. If you don't have one for some reason, we we can remedy that. Go by our guest center out here in the entry area. We'll we'll remedy that. We'll get you a Bible. But being a Christian is more than owning a Bible. Okay? Being a Christian is more than praying over a meal. I hope you do pray over your meals. I pray that, or I, I hope that you pray and express gratitude you know, for God providing. I mean, we, we live in a country where it's so easy to take stuff like that for granted, but the Bible is clear. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. So every meal you sit down and eat, I mean, God is making that possible. And it only makes good sense besides its good manners to thank the one that's providing. So I hope you do pray over your meal, but being a Christian is more than that. Being a Christian is more than being a decent moral person. I hope you're a decent person. And I'm talking outside of this hour, 9.15 on Sunday morning. I hope you're a decent person Sunday afternoon or as the case was two weeks ago Sunday night when your team is getting beat by 40 points. I hope you're still decent (laughs) in moments that you're tested. All right? I hope you're decent when you're at work or when you're hanging out with friends on Friday night. You know, you and I, we should be decent, moral people. But being a Christian, it goes beyond being a decent person. It goes beyond going to church. It goes beyond owning a Bible. It goes beyond praying over a meal. In a very real sense, if I could suggest this, being a Christian involves daily, every morning anew, taking the title of your life and signing it over to God. And giving it to him. Every day. First thing. You step out of bed. 
you sign over your life, the title of your life, Lord, it's yours today. That's what being a Christian is. Living sacrifices. There's a story about a young guy who was writing a, a little note to uh, his girlfriend. Nowadays, it would be you know, a text or something like that. But here's what he said. I would climb the highest mountain for you. I would swim the widest river for you. I would crawl across the burning sands of the desert for you. And then he added a P.S. If it doesn't rain on Wednesday night, I'll be over to see you. <laughs> All right? He just canceled out everything he said in the earlier statement. All these flowery and magical words and all that he was using. But then he made it clear that, well, as long as it's convenient for me, then, you know, I'll see you. Unfortunately, that's a whole lot like the way uh, many people approach their worship to God. They're very quick to say the right words in their prayers, in the songs that they sing. They say the right things, and they say these magical words, and words rich with devotion and adoration and love. But then, you know, if it's not convenient, well, take a rain check on that, Lord. I got something else that's come up, something else more important right now. Might that not define who we are? Might that not be the kind of believers we are? Might we be the people, as, as a priest of God, might we be the people that offer up regularly, consistently, every day, living sacrifices? We give ourselves up to him. One last time, 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, it refers to, how we are a royal priesthood. And we are to be offering sacrifices that are acceptable to him. That's what verse 5 of the text said. And we've looked at today at getting a glimpse at what that looks like. So here in a moment, we're going to be having our time of communion. And immediately following communion, we're going to have our time of offering. So while our ushers are getting up and preparing for communion, I want to just throw this out, and it's going to totally sound like a tongue-in-cheek sort of thing, and, and, uh, but yet it's a thought that I think will help drive home what I'm trying to say. After we're done with communion, which communion is all about focusing on God's great gift to us, the price that he paid by sending Jesus into the world, to die on our behalf. We take the bread and we eat it and we remember the body of Jesus. We take the cup and we drink it and we remember the blood of Jesus. We remember that sacrifice that he made on our behalf, the price that he was willing to pay to secure our salvation. All right, it's not by coincidence that we follow our time of communion with the time of offering. And you know what? In view of what we've talked about here today, here's an idea. When the offering tray comes to you, maybe you should just take it and set it down on the floor right in front of you and step into it. Because that's what these scriptures are talking about. Now you watch, you know, someone will do it. It'll probably be in that section, but so, someone will do that. We're not going to chastise you if, if, you, if that helps. What I want, though, is I want, I want that thought to get embedded in your mind. So every week, when our time of offering comes, it's not about pitching in a check and you're done. That represents you. It's giving yourself to the Lord. Not just a portion, but the Lord. You're bought and paid for. What happened on the cross? He deserves all of you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for how your word 
clarifies in our minds concepts that uh, are just incredible. And initially, probably a good number of us in this room with some of the things that we've referenced here today, we would have said, well, that sounds like extreme worship. But yet now, as we've talked through it all and we've, we've explored some of these passages in the Bible, now we better understand that it's not extreme. It's reasonable. This is reasonable worship. It's the logical thing in view of what Jesus did as he gave himself for us, we should give ourselves lock, stock, and barrel back to you. Father, while we take the cup and we take the bread and we eat and we drink, Lord, through your spirit, etch this into our memory. Living sacrifices. Those are the kind of sacrifices that you find acceptable. I pray that in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.